Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, I'm very grateful to Professor Hoppe and Dr. Imre Hoppe for that kind of invitation, and in particular for this challenge, because I have to admit the task that I have today is entirely impossible. You can't even understand the Iran in a lifetime, not to speak of 30 minutes, but I try my best to give you some background to the Iranian mindset. Already the name Iran is uh, quite politically incorrect, I have to say, as it derives from Ariyanam Veja, which means homeland of the Aryans. Uh, now those Aryans, those original Aryans, uh, were Indo-Germanic tribes, uh, and it wasn't so much a racial concept, but a, but a religious concept. Those tribes were united by common mythology and a common religion. Uh, the mythology uh, goes like that, that uh, they somehow came from the high north, Archaeology doesn't quite confirm that, to spread civilization to the south and to the west. Uh, being in the possession of some particular civilizational technologies, like horseback riding, the wheel, cattle farming, and then later on agriculture. Uh, and uh, part of this mission uh, is still uh, quite uh, alive uh, because Iranians are still prone to a kind of messianic nationalism, uh, which has come to be concealed under Islam. Uh, now, the Iranian religion was uh, shaped in, in uh, the second millennium before Christ by Zoroaster, uh, who uh, had a dualistic worldview, world view, but not in the sense that good and evil are equal, but they are equally strong. So it's a constant struggle between good and evil, and good uh, is associated with Ahur Mazda, uh, which is light and truth, whereas it's, uh, Ahriman, which is darkness and the lie. Uh, so it's quite interesting uh, religious concept, uh, and it is uh, highly underestimated how much it influenced Western thought through antiquity. Uh, there's a reference to objective values, and uh, Zoroastrians uh, believe that by good thoughts, good words, and good deeds, you should help bring light to the world, bring truth to the world, and fight evil and fight the lie. Uh, there are some quite interesting prophecies uh, linked uh, to Zoroastrian philosophy in uh, that later on it was claimed that Zoroaster uh, would uh, come back and be reborn as a redeemer king. And the sign of his advent would be shown by a star on the sky, which explains the three magi or magi uh, that came to Jesus' uh, birth. Uh, now, this concept is important to understand later de development. So, for the original Iranians, the, Islamic, the Islamization, the Islamic conquest, was at first conceived as a storm of darkness invading upon their civilization. Uh, but I think uh, one of the paradoxical results of this conquest uh, was that uh, Iranian culture has survived in a way I think it would not have without uh, Islamization. It's quite interesting. I think the same thing happened to the Austrian school, by the way. By having to leave Austria, it had to reassert itself later on. And I think that's the main reason why it survived as a distinct school and it didn't uh, 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 just disappear within other mainstream schools. Because if you are uh, under assault, you either die, and if you don't die, you have to reassert yourself. And that's what happened with Iranian culture. Uh, the Islamization, of course, it started uh, by using force. Uh, the Arab uh, nomads, which were united by Islamic seal, uh, used a particular advantage, uh, namely that there was internal conflict within the Iranian empire uh, between the Sassanids and the Parthians. Uh, so it was a particularly a good situation uh, for zealous warriors to, uh, in fact, uh, conquer in a fairly short amount of time this empire. Empires are usually quite easily conquered once there's a problem within. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the Islamization took about 300 years. Uh, there was a lot of resistance, a lot of rebellions uh, coming on and on. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, Iran, after 300 years, was largely a Sunni Muslim country. Now, the interesting thing is that after these 300 years, there was a reassertion of Iranic culture uh, in two ways. The one way was that Iran found that by uh, being based within the Islamic realm, which was uh, uh, quite imperialistic and thus enlarging its territory, uh, there was good use for intellectuals. 
Uh, Ibn Khaldun, uh, one of the first uh, sociologists uh, uh, in the world, has observed uh, a curious thing for him, that uh, he said that almost all the Islamic intellectuals that he, know, that he knows of are of Iranian descent, even those who have systematized the Arabic uh, grammar and language. Uh, now, that, that was quite odd. Uh, uh, to the uh, Arabs, but of course from the uh, Iranian point of view it was like uh, primitive nomads uh, invading uh, their country and they made good use of uh, this, this uh, framework. Now the other way that the Iranian culture reasserted itself uh, was by a literary uh, emergence. Uh, one of the most important and longest epic uh, poet, uh, uh, works of epic poetry was composed by Ferdowsi uh, before the first millennium uh, AD, uh, it's the Shah Nameh. And the thing that's really interesting about it is that uh, it's a, more than a thousand years old, but it still can be read and understood by everyone who speaks Persian today. And that shows you how important uh, that was for the language, and at the same time, how uh, language and culture was really conserved over a long period of time against all odds. Because it's really against all odds that the Iranian culture and language has survived this way. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is that it had to reassert itself. Uh, so uh, the, the Shah Nome, uh, is interesting in a way that it resembles a lot other Germanic, Celtic, and Scandinav Scandinavian uh, mythologies. Uh, it's uh, a story about kings and heroes, and the heroes are knights, and they're following virtues, objective virtues. Uh, there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of love, there's a lot of tragedy involved, there's in all of those stories. Uh, uh, but they're very succinct and very different from what you would expect from Islamic poetry, even though it was a time where Iran was formerly Islamic uh, already. Uh, another odd thing to reassert Iranian identity uh, was the adoption of the Shia faith. Uh, how did it uh, come about? Uh, one would have expected uh, the Iran to uh, become, uh, to somehow disappear in the Ottoman Empire, uh, maybe conserve some of its language and culture, but as a political entity to disappear in a larger uh, Muslim realm. Uh, now, oddly enough, uh, a, a Sufi, uh, a militant Sufi order uh, arising from the region of Azerbaijan, the uh, Safaviyya, uh, decided uh, to enforce uh, Shia Islam on Iran, also by force. It was a forced conversion, but Shia Islam somehow attached to former Zoroastrian elements in a better way than the Sunni Islam. Now, from the Shia perspective, what's the difference uh, to Sunni Islam? From the Shia perspective, um, the, the leader of the faithful has to be selected by God because otherwise it will be selected by party politics, by power politics. And that's what the, the Shiites have experienced according to their interpretation of history. That when Mohammed, uh, he appointed his son-in-law Ali as his successor. But while his family was still occupied with preparing uh, his burial, uh, the Arab tribes uh, just chose another leader. Uh, and uh, so from then on, uh, you have a split uh, between uh, the Sunni and the Shiite view, who should be the leader of the faithful. According to the Shiites, it shows you that uh, uh, injustice and evil is so strong, again, going back to Zoroastrian belief, that evil is equally strong as good, uh, that it uh, even uh, subdued the family of the prophet himself. So injustice is really a very strong force which you have to fight against. Um, the Shiites believe that, that uh, Ali's wife, thus the daughter of uh, Muhammad himself, was attacked by the Sunni Muslims, that she was beaten, that she lost her child due to death, that his house was put on fire. And uh, every imam, the Shiites call the spiritual leader, the imam, every imam has been killed at the order of a caliph. That is the uh, leader of the polit political leader of the Islamic world. So from early on, uh, the Shiites had a perception of being a persecuted minority because they are the party of principle uh, and the party of the God-appointed leader where, uh, versus the power-oriented, uh, corrupting uh, Islamic politicians in a way that abuse religion for the strife for power. 
Uh, so being a minority within Islam played out very well for the Iranian mindset uh, by feeling themselves to be a minority amongst uh, the incursions of the Arabs, which of course in the beginning tried to eradicate the uh, Persian language and replace it with uh, Arabic, which is the language of the Quran, thus a holy language. Uh, um, so uh, the uh, Shiites uh, believed that you had a series of 12 Imams, the 12 are Shiites, which are the dominant Shiites in Iran, uh, with the 12th Imam disappearing. Uh, they also believed that uh, uh, the uh, younger son of Ali, who tried to engage uh, the other Muslims and tried to reassert the leadership of the family of the Prophet uh, was murdered as all other uh, descendants of Muhammad who claimed uh, their right uh, to leadership. Uh, and he was murdered because even his own uh, uh, followers left him because of fear. Uh, so, you, until this day, you have a very important holiday in Shiite Islam, which is a memorial of uh, this kind of, of the killing of Hussein uh, and uh, him being left by his fellow Shiite followers. As so we have processions in Iran, which very much resemble fundamentalist Christian uh, processions with a lot of self-regulation. Uh, when you're in a great mosque and you see a group uh, of people suddenly starting to cry, they're most probably Shiites. Uh, so there's a lot of suffering, and, and there's also a concept which is quite close to, to Christian uh, religious thought that Hossein had to die for our sins because we didn't come to, to his help, to his rescue, because of fear, because of corruption, and so on. Uh, the 12th Imam uh, in this line is thought to have disappeared and to come back to the world. He's in occultation as the Shiites believe, and he'll come back to the world as a kind of redeemer king. So there you have the old Zoroastrian prophecy. And interestingly enough, the Shiites believe that he will come with Jesus. So they'll come hand in hand, more or less, to judge the world, at Judgment Day, and, and establish the internal kingdom. Uh, so there's a quite, quite uh, um, odd stance, which explains a lot of tenets of, of uh, the Iranian development. Um, um, to uh, further understand the Iranian development, uh, uh, you see, a truth was a very important issue for Iranian fallen Iranian religion. Uh, the Greeks who described the Persians, uh, uh, they uh, mentioned and highlighted the truth is taught to the young people from an early age on to always tell the truth. Yeah. Now, when you compare it to contemporary Iranians, uh, you'd be quite surprised the truth doesn't seem to play uh, such an important role. Uh, uh, on the opposite, uh, uh, you'd always hear uh, say about Iranians that they are the perfect liars. Uh, Rothbard, in class uh, theory, uh, uh, to state it, uh, says that it's not the Marxist view that it's the rich and the poor who are opposed to each other, but rather it's, it's the state and the population, and those who use just economic terms for their survival. And that's directly the Iranian point of view. They call the two classes uh, melat and dolat, the, the people and the state. It's always people versus the state. Uh, which leads to the paradoxical conclusion for an Iranian, that whenever the state is weak, you have to hit it. You know? It makes it difficult to understand revolutions uh, in Iran because, uh, for, for example, the revolution against the Shah wasn't a revolution because the Shah was so oppressed, it was perceived to be so oppressive at the time of the revolution. To the contrary, uh, beginning in 1977, the Shah started a, a policy of opening up and allowing discourse and allowing political debate and so on. It was a liberalizing tendency. But because you have this gulf between society and the state, the Iranian mindset would say, okay, the state is weak, let's hit him while he's weak. Not, not wait when it's strong, let's hit it while it's weak. Uh, uh, so I think uh, phenomena like the uh, Arabic uh, uh, Spring, or which Islam uh, uh, fra uh, phrases this more correctly as the Islamic Spring uh, is widely misunderstood. It's of course not a Facebook-driven uh, pro-democracy event that's going on there. Uh, and uh, of course the manifestation on, on the street in Iran weren't really that much about this issue and they weren't really that much about uh, uh, 
uh, proposing an alternative to the Islamic Republic. It's perce they perceived the state as being weak again because there was some internal struggle within a very, very complicated power structure, which I try uh, to explain uh, to you. Uh, I hope uh, time <laughs> will suffice to, to do that. Uh, another thing that uh, Rothbard was very correct about when you want to understand Iranian history is the importance of millenarian thought for political ideologies. Uh, of course, uh, the ideology between the Iranian revolution was not so much homebred. It was interestingly developed in the West. Khomeini spent a lot of time in Paris, uh, and uh, the thinkers behind the Iranian revolution uh, were very much, very deeply versed in Marxist and postmodernist thought. Uh, one of the most influential figures probably was Ali Shariati, uh, of whom uh, Sartre himself uh, has said that if I would have to choose a religion, I choose the religion of Ali Shariati. What did Shariati do? Uh, he uh, picked up anti-imperialism uh, and or other kind of leftist anti-Western thought, and he said to himself, well, we've got this problem, we can't make a Marxist revolution work in Iran. And he perceived without uh, explicitly telling so, because we don't have these classes. We have a different class theory. It's not the rich versus the poor. It would be impossible to have a Marxist revolution in Iran because people know, okay, either you're with the state or you're against the state. It's not, it's not between the population. It's not different interests of the population. It's always the interests of coercion versus the interest of the people. So the only way to have that kind of revolution was somehow linking it to the strife of Iranians for justice, which, is very, which was very much linked in Zoroastrian thought and is, a deep, is of deep importance in Islam and in particular in Shiite Islam. And to somehow link it to the martyrdom of Hussein. So he used a lot of Shiite concept to just put uh, into practice Western leftist thought. That, that's what he basically tried here. He translated this thought to Shiite concepts. Uh, uh, so uh, that was quite influential on the early uh, proponents of the uh, Islamic revolution. The revolution started because the state was perceived as weak. Uh, a lot of liberals, Democrats, communists played the useful idiots for the Islamists, as it usually happens. Uh, and uh, the problem was, of course, the big promise of bringing justice. Uh, and whenever you have a millenarian utopian thought, uh, after a short while you realize justice is not coming about, or justice means poverty, it means starvation. It just doesn't work. Utopian economic policies just don't work. If you follow Islamic course, it doesn't bring you all the promised goods and the promised land. Uh, Particular, it was particularly a strong streak in uh, Khomeini's ideology because he was the one who did the shift from a premillenarian thought to postmillenarian thought. Postmillenarian thought, as Rothbard explained it, uh, differs from premillenarian thought in that you think you have to actively do something to bring about the millennium. So the former Shiite clergy, they all believed that the Mahdi will come. So they have an apocalyptic vision. But you can't do anything to hasten his arrival on earth. So better you uh, abstain from politics, because politics as it is today, it is, uh, in, it's always be unjust, it's just not the right politics. For right politics, you have to wait for the redeemer. You can't have a, a good, a just policy now. So it's only the post millenarians who think you have to do something in the present in order that the redeemer will come. And you can do something so that he will come earlier. And that was the important uh, change in, in ideology and thought and what made it uh, uh, so, so dangerous in the beginning. But of course the Mahdi didn't arrive, uh, which might have been a surprise in the beginning. Uh, uh, and then uh, the only thing that helped uh, this Islamic revolution, this Islamic Republic to survive was the devil himself, as you might say, and in the eyes of Khomeini, he was very glad that the devil, devil himself interfered because it made the it highlighted the struggle between good and evil, and the de devil at the time was Saddam Hussein, who used to try to use the weakness of Iran and getting some oil fields, of course, and getting some land uh, from Iran. Of course, Iran was, was weakened. I mean, you just had a regime change, uh, the military, 
had to be rebuilt in a way. So even though Islam, uh, Iran is larger than Iraq, uh, in the beginning it looked like it would fail and, and would be easy war for Hussein. But then Khomeini realized that you can use all those concepts of the revolution, in particular the martyrdom of Hussein, to instill a new kind of warfare. And it was one of the bloodiest wars in history. Uh, what the Iranians did was just send on children to the battlefield as martyrs. So just use the high number of people that they have in contrast to Iraq. And they sent waves of people uh, to block off the missiles and the mines and, and uh, whatsoever. So it was a terrible kind of warfare. Uh, but what Iran learned in this process is that their conventional army didn't really work that well. It was a particular asymmetrical warfare which worked in the end. And that was an important lesson for Iran. Uh, of course, the war is always was the health of the state and the Islamic Republic could assert itself against all opposition because, as always, if you are in war, a centralized state proves to be a quite useful asset. Uh, so, uh, what happened after the war? The interesting thing and a lot of uh, things to learn for libertarians from uh, Iran is that coercion doesn't work. Uh, the effects of this coercive policy of bringing about the perfect just Islamic society uh, didn't only not work, but at the opposite, it brought about results which Khomeini would never have expected. And it, that's very odd for observers from the West. You would expect Iran to be a, a highly Islamic coercive society, but to the contrary, if you compare it with all, all other Societies in the Middle East, Iran is the most secularized, most pro-Western society in the region. That's very odd. If you talk to a regular Iranian, they are very interested in the West. They, they feel no kind of hatred. They might feel some kind of injustice that's done to the country. But on a personal level, they are very eager if they have a chance to go to the West, to learn from the West, uh, you find when you're traveling Iran that people are very friendly to foreigners. Uh, well, I guess one of the countries where people are friendliest, maybe on, on the earth, uh, uh, what I hear from stories of people going there. Uh, so that's quite amazing. Has it worked in bringing virtue about in the Islamic, uh, Islamic society? On the contrary, Iran is now one of the countries with the highest drug addiction. Prostitution is looming. An odd thing, the prostitution is run by mullahs. How do they do it? Because they have a Shiite instrument, the Thai marriage, which allows Shiite to marry for a short period of time. Of course, now you have very strong incentives as a mullah who can do that kind of marriage to get money for doing a time marriage. And of course, time marriage might last as long as an hour. And, and you realize that it pays as well to have the room uh, that you offer the room as well. So it's just economic logic which brings about these results. And it's quite odd because there you see, so a lot of current Iran is, is a fight between economic reality and, and intentions of coercive power, which always fail. Another interesting thing that it did something in Islamic thought within Iran. Uh, I'd say that there developed a, a very strange phenomenon of po politically libertarian Islamic scholars. You would be so surprised if you know what uh, uh, leading Grand Ayatollahs say to what the regime. Now, Iran is conceived as a theocracy. Uh, the problem is, after Khomeini, it stopped being a theocracy in the sense of having a really highly esteemed scholar at the top because they couldn't find any Shiite scholar of importance to endorse this kind of republic. As I told you, most Shi Shiite cler clerics uh, before were premillenarian, so they uh, distanced themselves from politics. Uh, the interesting thing about Shia uh, Islam is that there's a clergy, uh, uh, like, uh, like the church in Christendom, and you have a bottom-up process of selection where even the phenomenon of an Islamic pope might emerge. It's called the Machai Taglit. Uh, among the Grand Ayatollahs, you become a Grand Ayatollah by having a lot of education, many years of education, many exams, and you're considered by uh, uh, an Islamic school to be uh, a, a scholar of the utmost uh, importance and quality. Now, if you yourself as a Grand Ayatollah are considered a Machai Taglit, which means a source of imitation by other Grand Ayatollahs, 
then you might rise above the Grand Ayatollahs. And it happens every now and then that one single Grand Ayatollah is selected voluntarily by all other Grand Ayatollahs as their source of imitation. Which means if they have uh, uh, a conflict uh, uh, or, or a doubt about something, they'd ask him, they'd refer to him to settle their conflict. The last time that was this kind of Islamic poll was uh, in 1961, that's when the last Majai Taklid was accepted by all Grand Ayatollahs died. Uh, since then there have been various Grand Ayatollahs. Uh, interesting thing is there was no Grand Ayatollah that could serve as the supreme leader of Iran. Because even the only one that agreed to Khomeini's uh, heresy, in fact, Khomeini's ideology is, is a Shiite heresy, it's not mainstream Shiite theology. Even the only one who agreed that uh, the Grand Ayatollah might play a role before the Mahdi comes, all others say, no, you have to uh, guide the souls of the people but not do politics because this, uh, you, you will destroy religion by doing it. The only one who agreed to that, Grand Ayatollah Montaseri, disappointed Khomeini because Montaseri said, uh, Wow, you did the same thing that the Shah did, but only in the name of religion. How dare you? How dare you? So well, there was a big conflict you couldn't, of course, be uh, following uh, uh, Khomeini. So a politician was selected who had credentials in the war, who was an ayatollah, but was not in, regard, in high regard by other ayatollahs. So it was a, a, a second-class clergy member who turned out to be a politician who became the supreme leader, Khamenei, who still is the supreme leader today. Uh, he's, he's not in high esteem by any Shiite clergy. Uh, so you can't really consider that theocracy, I'd say, uh, by now. Uh, interestingly, other Grand Ayatollahs were even more explicit in, in how they judged uh, the Islamic Republic. For example, Grand Ayatollah uh, Yusuf al Sani. he said, and I tried to, uh, to translate it as literally as I can, he said, the clergy has lost their holiness because they became part of the power elite. Governing, he says, governing all, always means lying to your population and stealing from your population. Governing always means that. In his words, as a Grand Ayatollah, Shiat clergy is saying that. So if you govern, you destroy religion and you become a criminal. I mean, that's one of the most important Shiite, Shiite, Shiite uh, Grand Ayatollahs, uh, who of course is under house arrest, like most other Grand Ayatollahs in Iran. So Iran is actually imprisoning its own clergy. <laughs> uh, now, the power conflict within Iran now, it's quite uh, complicated to un understand uh, because it's a struggle uh, within um, uh, the, 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 the ruling classes. Um, what, what happened is that, uh, as most Grand Ayatollahs observed, power corrupts. So, the saying by Lord Acton, it was uh, validated in Iran, power corrupts. But the interesting lesson from Iran to learn is that power does not only corrupt good principles, power also corrupts bad principles. Of course, those were very principled people in the beginning of the Islamic Revolution. But by using power and by profiting from power and by earning riches, their bad principles got corrupted as well. So now you have people uh, who are leading the Basij and the Pastaran. Those were paramilitary forces to withstand uh, the Iraqi invasion. Uh, you have those people who ended up controlling a large part of the Iranian economy. And by this way they became managers and they became entrepreneurs. And it's very interesting to observe now that you have these apparent fundamentalists who are not interfering in their own enterprises because they realized, okay, if we try to apply our Islamic principles, it just doesn't work that way. If you try to put our people who are fighters on the street in, in, in a position, in a management position, it just doesn't work. It doesn't bring the same result, the same wealth for us. So they've become very pragmatic uh, over the last years. So the uh, ruling class in Iran is completely different from the early revolutionary class. They're very pragmatic, quite rational people. Uh, which surprises a lot of observers in the region. In particular, the Israeli uh, uh, secret service are quite surprised how rational their supposed enemy is. Uh, and in the whole uh, uh, Middle Eastern region, people would rather consider as the irrational and fundamentalist power the United States. Because from everything that they see and try to judge, they see, okay, it makes sense what Iran does. 
And the strange thing is when Iran is supporting uh, uh, groups outside, they never uh, want their allegiance to their religious ideas. They're very pragmatic. They don't demand from a Sunni group that they are supporting that they turn over to Shia. But what they observe at the same time is with uh, the American invasion, hundreds of missionaries came to Iraq, for example. So they're wondering, okay, who are the fundamentalists now? Because they don't see any missionaries from Iran working there. So the perception is completely opposite. You're seeing an irrational force from the outside the United States versus a rational, quite dominant power in the region, which by this corruption of bad principle has become quite pragmatic. Of course, in no way I would defend the regime, uh, but it's quite strange, it's paradoxical, that this kind of re regime with this kind of ideological background would turn out to be the most regional actor in the Middle East right now. Uh, what Iran is striving for is uh, being appreciated by other Muslims, maybe filling the gap within Sunni Islam, which has proved to be impotent, even from the fruit of Muslims. It could not withstand Israel, it could not withstand the United States. Sunnis have lost almost every war that they have started, they have engaged in. Uh, so that's now the chance that Iran sees to uh, preserve its position in, in the region as regional power, and they are quite surprised that uh, I'd say that the U United States is not cooperating with them, but with uh, Takfiri movements, the Taliban and so on, Sunni so fundamentalists, with, uh, in contrast to uh, uh, the so-called Iranian fundamentalists, are in undisciplined, and they are the greatest enemy of Iran, the greatest danger to Iran, because as I said, in Shia, in Shia you have a clergy, you have a process of, of interpretation of Quran. It's not allowed, as in the Protestant faith, quite similar to Catholic versus Protestant. You can't just go on and interpret the Quran as you like it, and you read something and you go on slaughtering infidels, but you have to uh, go through a process of interpretation and the clergy that, that guides you and that might use uh, uh, tactical means of if there is a reason, if there's a rational uh, aim to be fulfilled. So I think I have to finish now. I told you it was an impossible task. I hope I was able to give you a bit of a background. Thank you very much for your patience.